Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Good morning. There we go, there it is, second time around. Tomorrow it's going to be first time, I know it is, I know it is. But I would forgive you if you were uh, a little slow after last night, those of you who were at the castle. Wasn't that a great night? <laughs> Fantastic. Great, great location, uh, great food, great company, of course, the networking, and, uh, and what a band. What a lot of fun. ACDC hip hop and bagpipes in one song. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that, but uh, yeah, fantastic. But uh, those of you who weren't there, Sorry you missed it, but um, it, was, it was great. Um, and welcome to those of you who are joining us today. Um, mind showing, uh, put, putting a brief show of hands, those of you who weren't here yesterday and are today. Good, good. And those of you who weren't here yesterday and aren't today. Yeah, there you go. I knew there'd be some. Yeah. Good, good, good. So um, we've... Welcome to the TOGAF user group, that's what this session is, and we will be um, live streaming, we're recording the whole event uh, this morning, and we will be live streaming uh, the first two presentations this morning, um, because that's going to be going out as our episode of Toolkit Tuesday, which we do every two weeks, um, a 30 minute segment every two weeks of broadcast. And uh, this week we get to be, or well, this two weeks, we get to be live from Edinburgh. So um, uh, be aware of that. So I will, after the uh, initial intros, I will just say a few uh, uh, words of welcome to those who will be joining us remotely. But um, those of you here, uh, let's see, uh, the Wi-Fi, uh, it's, a, it's around somewhere, it will be on slides and whatever, but the Wi-Fi is, uh, SSID is delegate with a capital D, delegate, and the password is Haymarket, all lowercase. And uh, the way we do questions, and please do uh, get some questions, we do have a panel session at the end today, um, so I think we're gonna, gonna be holding questions for the panel session. Um, but please don't wait until that point to put them in. As the speaker is, uh, is talking, please put the questions in and then we can uh, get a more organized panel, hopefully for you later. We've got a, a number of quick-fire presentations this morning, uh, relatively short, um, uh, but uh, lots to get through. Um, so get on with it, Steve. Uh, coffee breaks will be outside, um, outside the doors you just came in, make it real simple for you today. And lunch will be on uh, this level as well, Lennox One Room. Uh, you, can't, you won't be able to miss it. We are having a drinks reception this evening. I'll say more about the tracks that we go into uh, later before we break for lunch. But uh, there will be a networking reception for everybody. Uh, everybody welcome, 5.30 in the concourse area outside here. So we're making it really simple. You just need to be here in, on this level. Um, uh, thank you to our sponsors for, this, uh, uh, for, for their support for this event. Um, it is important, and you'll see uh, some of them have exhibit tables outside. Please, please do take the time to visit them. They'd love to see you. Uh, sponsors this week are Boomi, Connexium, Dell Technologies, Mega International, the Association of Enterprise Architects, and Van Haren Publishing. So thank you to them. Right. Pausing. So welcome to our viewers, uh, our, our attendees for Toolkit Tuesday. You join us live in Edinburgh uh, this week, 
um, at part of the open group event, and we are having a TOGAF user group here at the EICC in Edinburgh. Fantastic venue. Um, we've got uh, some great presentations coming up, some people in the room, so uh, the speakers will be uh, aware that they are addressing both you, at, uh, both you uh, online, as you're joining us remotely, and uh, the people in the room. So, uh, welcome. Uh, we've got a great, a great lineup today, and I want to keep us uh, on track so that you have the uh, full, uh, full time allotted for each of our speakers, so I'm going to move right into it. But I do hope wherever you are in the world, uh, you're keeping well, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of your, your day, night, whatever it may be, to join us. So, our first speaker today is Chris Ford, who is the General Manager, Asia Pacific Region, and the Vice President of Enterprise Architecture at the Open Group. Uh, it's always good to introduce a, a colleague, so uh, welcome, Chris. He's based in Shanghai, and as General Manager of Asia Pacific, Chris is responsible for the business functions in that area. As the Vice President of Enterprise Architecture, he is responsible for the enterprise architecture portfolio in the Open Group, including the TOGAF and Archimate standards, among other things. And Chris is also the CEO of the Association of Enterprise Architects, one of our sponsors here today. And today, Chris is going to give a brief overview of the TOGAF Standard 10th edition. So a warm welcome from the Open Group event and Toolkit Tuesday for Chris Ford. Thanks, Steve. Over to you, sir. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as Steve said, the topic, uh, the topic for the presentation today is the TOGAF Standard 10th edition. Uh, which we launched at our London event in April of 2022. So what's new in this edition? What's new is an increasingly modular structure, expanded context-specific content. The expanded content includes, for example, domain-specific materials. The updated document structure and expanded content delivers on what we've heard from practitioners what they told us they wanted, more, better, and topical guidance on how to deliver the best enterprise architecture that supports their stakeholders and their organizations. How do we, how do we make the TOGAF standard, or you know, for that matter, any standard that the Open Group produces? All of our activities at the Open Group are member-driven, leveraging the experience of subject matter experts, and developed in an open and consensus-based manner through the Open Group standards process. The TOGAF standard is developed by EA practitioners whose organizations are members of the Architecture Forum. When appropriate, the Architecture Forum uh, and other members collaborate across lines of specialty through what we call working groups. Um, they collaborate with other SMEs in other areas. Now, for examples of these are the current government EA working group and the ecosystems working group, which Phil will talk about shortly. And those working groups are open to all members, those two examples. Currently, we have many TOGAF-specific pipeline activities underway. Those activities are in addition to the 20 series guides that we delivered in April. And I mean many <laughs> activities. Um, to paraphrase Mick Adams, who's uh, one of the two current co-chairs, along with Celine, who spoke yesterday of the Architecture Forum, this is the busiest, most consequential, and most productive period he has seen during his involvement with the Open Group and with TOGAF. That's saying a lot because I've been around this organization 15 years and I think Mick's been around it about the same amount of time. So what is the TOGAF standard? It's an enterprise architecture framework containing a methodology. It's developed by and for EA practitioners to architect based on best practices. It's used by the world's leading organizations to simultaneously transform their business models and improve operational efficiency. So what's interesting about this is it's good in good times 
and it's good in bad times. It's comprehensive, modular, and configurable. And a key point is that it's vendor and technology neutral or agnostic. Now, regarding the modular structure, in the top right of this slide is a partial representation of the Open Group Library, which contains multiple standards and materials such as TOGAF, Open Agile Architecture, Archimate, Security, Healthcare, Commercial Aviation, Banking, Process Automation, Trusted Technology, IT for IT. That's just a partial list of the materials available to you through the Open Group Library. Now, all of those materials are available from the Open Group's homepage. You just go up there, click on the library component. But today our focus is in the uh, center of the slide um, on the representation of the TOGAF library within uh, the Open Group library, and specifically the, standard, uh, the TOGAF standard 10th edition. Now there are two major chunks of the 10th edition. Uh, the six part fundamental content and the 20 TOGAF series guides I referred to that are actually grouped in here in uh, summary groupings. The fundamental content should be relatively stable and enduring. Uh, the series guides are more dynamic and more fluid in terms of frequency of changes and in the delivery of additional topical content over time. Now on the right side of the slide, also in the TOGAF library, related to but outside of the standard, you will find additional guidance, white papers, um, tools, and other materials available to you in multiple formats. The, this area of the library is actually quite important, and I'll illustrate why with a specific example shortly. The TOGAF Standard 10th Edition is currently available in multiple formats, three in particular here. HTML, PDF, and printed books. And uh, as I said before, you can go to the library via our homepage to access and order these formats. Now, it's, it's easy to get lost in the new messages, so I just wanted to comment on continuity because the core character of the TOGAF standard is retained within the 10th edition. So for example, you will still find catalogs, diagrams of matrices, the ADM, the architecture development method, and uh, you know, enterprise segment and capability partitioning uh, referenced in the standards. In terms of impactful change, the fundamental content is revised and reorganized. In the center of the diagram here are the six parts of the TOGAF standard fundamental content the introduction and core concepts, the ADM, ADM techniques, applying the ADM, architecture content, enterprise architecture capability and governance. Now, if you're interested in uh, statistics in terms of words, for this segment of the standard, 58% of it is unchanged. 12% is updated and 30% is relatively new. For example, we put anchors into that segment of the standard for the series guides. As I said, we expect the fundamental content to be relatively stable and enduring. Now, continuing with impactful change, this list of 20 TOGAF series guides total about 1,089 pages. So if you reflect back to version 9.2, if you took out the front matter and the appendices, you'd be dealing with about 7, 6, 60, 700 pages worth of stuff. And the, the, here we're talking about 1,089 pages in the series guides, <coughs> excuse me, and about 550 pages in the fundamental content. So it's a lot of material. The TOGAF series guides offer how-to and domain-specific guidance for practitioners on applying the TOGAF standard across a range of topics and contexts. And this list will continue to grow and be revised over time. 
Now let's look at the list of series guides in another way. In groups of related content, such as general how-to. So here we have the practitioner's approach to developing enterprise architecture using the uh, TOGAF ADM. Digital technology adoption, a guide to readiness assessment, readiness assessment and road mapping. Using the TOGAF standard in the digital enterprise. Domain specifics, we have six guides on business architecture covering business models, capabilities, value streams, information mapping, and organizational mapping. A guide for integrating risk and security with the TOGAF enterprise architecture. A guide for customer master data management. And two guides relative to agile methods at the moment, enabling enterprise agility and applying the TOGAF ADM using agile sprints. Continuing with the groupings, reference models and methods. Digital business reference models, government reference model, architecture maturity models, architecture project management, and architecture skills framework. Now, for capability owners and sponsors of EA, there's a leader's guide to establishing and evolving an EA capability. So I keep on emphasizing the new stuff and how much there is, and everybody's going, whoa, whoa, what the heck? How do I figure out where to start? Well, here's where you should look to orient yourself on the 10th edition. This white paper is your starting point. It's titled An Introduction to the TOGAF Standard 10th Edition. Uh, the content is written for three audiences. Enterprise architecture practitioners, leaders of enterprise architecture teams, and sponsors of enterprise architecture. Stakeholders, implementers, planners, and other consumers of EA are rarely directly involved in your customized implementation of the TOGAF standard. Instead, consumers of EA are typically interested in using the outputs of EA to provide options and recommendations to guide their decisions and to govern the direction of those decisions in implementation change control, management. That's to say they're interested in the outcomes, not in the sausage making of architecture or customizations of it. Now this white paper contains an explanation on the motivation for and the substance of the revisions and the new additions to the TOGAF standard 10th edition. It includes recommendations on how to start using the standard and also in appendix A gives you a detailed set of release notes on changes to the fundamental content. Now, I referenced earlier multiple formats. This is the digital HTML edition. And in this um, material, which is available online, it's linked, navigable, and searchable from this landing page. You can hopefully see the URL at the bottom here. And this will be repeated at the end of the, uh, of the presentation. In the first column on the left, the navigation graphic shows links to the getting started and what's new content. In the second column begins the standard specific content practitioner guidance, organizing EA content, domain specifics, and so on. This digital edition brings together the fundamental content and TOGAF series guides, and our intent is to make it easier to navigate and search the fundamental and extended content together and comprehensively. We expect to evolve this continuously as we expand and refresh the content of the standard and as we receive feedback from you on usability and relevance. You can, of course, download the PDF and buy the books. Um, and actually, you know, the intent here is to help you use the material in the way you want to consume it in terms of those formats. One of the uh, newer features here with the uh, digital edition, which is quite important in my view, is the ability to provide feedback in real time on any part of the TOGAF standard. So when you go down through that navigation path, uh, you'll find an itemized list in the left side about what content is available, but also a little icon at the top for comments and bugs. And if you click on that, 
uh, you're going to launch a form which you can fill out in context and submit comments or bug reports about things that are a problem with the standard. So for example, in one of the meetings yesterday, <laughs> excuse me, a lady from the MOD was saying, I found consistency issues with terminology or language, and how are you going to deal with that? Well, we can't catch all of that necessarily in the editorial process, but as you see it, you can tell us, and we can uh, uh, try and deal with it. So how does that occur? Feedback through these forms are triaged by our editorial team, and then where appropriate, if it's not just an editorial issue, uh, it's routed to the architecture forum directors on my team, and it's addressed um, prioritized by the product team and by the forum members for disposition. So I really encourage you, whether you choose to interact you know, with the uh, PDF material or the books or digitally online with us through the HTML, and you find an issue or you like or dislike something that's going on, please use this feature to comment and let us know what your, what your impressions and, and what needs to be corrected. Now, earlier I mentioned that I'd provide an example of other important content in the library. Here, this guide document titled How to Use the Archimate Modeling Language to Support the TOGAF Standard was actually published simultaneously with the 10th edition. But you wouldn't know it because it wasn't part of the standard and wasn't advertised as such. It's in the TOGAF library. I'll be done soon. It's uh, in the TOGAF library, uh, but it's not a part of the certification program. So why should you pay attention to it? The document was a collaborative effort between the Archimate Forum and the Architecture Forum. And it proposes example models using Archimate notation. And I've extracted here the Enterprise Continuum and the ADDM represent, represented in Archimate. There's also a textual comparative analysis of the relevant components of the standards. Beyond the text, the models in Archimate notation are available for you to use and customize for your own organization. You can access them through the Open Group Archimate Exchange file format and import them to any EA tool certified to support that Exchange file format. Now, there are many other examples of useful materials for you in the Open Group Library in general and the TOGAF Library specifically uh, for you to leverage in your architecture endeavors. The main point being that the library is a source of multiple resources for architecting and accelerating the architecture delivery and time to value. The main point being that the library, uh, I'm sorry, well, <laughs> I'll repeat that. Now, Mark Lankhorst will be covering this material in more depth later in the session today. So looking ahead for content, what's our intent? More TOGAF series guides in development, more EA supporting content, such as guides on white papers like I just referenced, more frequent updates to the TOGAF standard, and innovative ways to access and adapt the content. As I said earlier, actually there are currently 20 pipeline activities underway related just to the TOGAF standard in our enterprise architecture portfolio of products. So we delivered 20 to you in the market in April, and we've got 20 in the pipeline. Looking ahead for TOGAF certification, yesterday during the plenary session uh, of the Edinburgh event, Andrew Josie, our VP of Standards and Certifications, at the Open Group and Dave Hornford, a partner at Connexium, announced and reviewed the TOGAF certification portfolio following a successful beta. Andrew will do a deeper dive on TOGAF certification later, but here's a brief reference. The TOGAF certification portfolio includes the TOGAF 9 certifications, TOGAF Enterprise Architecture certification, TOGAF Business Architecture certification, and TOGAF certification credentials. New learning paths have been developed that include direct paths from TOGAF 9 Foundation and upwards, and recognition of TOGAF 9 certification with a bridge path to the new materials. Now, here's a, la a list of uh, staff emails of folks who can be contact points for you, and two are URLs uh, for access to the, uh, the current materials. And 
that's basically what I had to cover for you today. Uh, thank you for joining us here at the TOGAF user group session uh, in Edinburgh and the Toolkit Tuesday broadcast. Uh, Steve, back to you. Thank you. And uh, as, a, as a reminder, we will be doing questions um, on the panel session that follows later, which I realize for those of you joining us remotely on Talk It Tuesday means uh, you won't be uh, able to hear them live, but it does. you can still submit um, questions, and we will be having this whole session will be available on the Open Group YouTube channel next week. So even if you can't see them on Toolkit Tuesday today, if you do submit a question, we'll hopefully get to it on the panel and you'll be able to see how it was answered then. I started talking about questions earlier. So to submit questions, please go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and uh, enter the hashtag uh, O-G-E-D-I, uh, small O-G, capital E, capital D, capital I and then you'll be able to submit your questions. You don't need to download anything, just any connected device will get you there. Just a reminder on that. So, thank you, Chris, for, uh, for the uh, great introduction. Uh, our next speaker is Phil Tetlow, who is the CTO, data uh, CTO at Data Ecosystems with IBM. For the past 21 years, Phil has worked for IBM as a technical architect, and he's also the Academy of Technology Vice President Emerging Technology where he helps top 100 companies build really big data and analytics, at analytics IT systems. In this session, Phil will look at ecosystems architecture, which is a new era of network of systems working towards shared goals, often above enterprise level. So a warm welcome from the Open Group and Talk It Tuesday, please, for Phil Tetlow. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. The clicker's on there. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good evening for those watching on YouTube. Thank you very much for um, giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I want to talk to you about a challenge, uh, but more a huge opportunity that we have as a global community of architects. And if I do this properly, I might be telling you where we're all about to head. Uh, I thought about how I wanted to present this morning and I decided I could do it one of two ways. Either I could tell you about uh, some things that a growing community of architects have been doing, or I thought I could tell you a story about a whole series of meetings and coincidences and realizations, and I decided it was probably best to do it the informal way and tell you a story. So, where to start? When I was a, a young technician, dare I say a young architect, I can remember being um, in a taxi. I had a long taxi ride with a very, very senior internationally recognized software engineer. Uh, and I was talking to him about the nuances of architecture and practice and technical challenges and so on and so forth. And he stopped me after about 20 minutes and he said, Phil, 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 that's great. He said, but... Uh, you need to understand something. He said, there are only two things that we get better at as we, as we increase our understanding of technology. He said, the first thing is we learn how to scale. He said, we build bigger, better, faster, stronger things. He said, that's always been the history of technology. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about silicon. You can be talking about stone or metal or bronze. or That's what we do as a species. And he said, the second thing is generally as we build bigger, as we scale out, we tend to increase the complexity of the things that we build. As we build bigger bridges, we need to introduce new and different techniques and technologies for uh, handling the spans that we aspire to cross, handling the loads that we expect those spans to be able to uh, hold. And he said, but there's a flip side to um, scale, uh, and that's complexity. Uh, and he said, um, the thing is that the human brain isn't particularly good at handling increased levels of complexity. We were built to throw spears and, and stones at buffalo and rhino on the plains, not to build bridges and steam engines. He said to compensate what the human brain does is we, we, we abstract. We move away from the problem so that we can handle more and more stuff inside the limited capacity of the human brain. And I remember learning from that session and thinking I'll carry that forward. 
And if you relate to those two ideas, or, or, or if, you, if you look at the history of technology and specifically architecture, IT architecture, through the lens of complexity and uh, of, through the lens of scale and complexity, then this is probably the way that our profession or our industry has played out or has played out. So in the early years of the IT industry, we worried about, we worried about bits and bytes. Then eventually we scaled out to dare to worry about units that we used to refer to as being programs. Then we became even more ambitious. We started to talk about objects and components. And eventually we became so adventurous we started to talk about systems. And then eventually we got to the point where today we talk about systems of systems. And when we talk about systems of systems, we generally give the systems of systems a particular label. We refer to those collections of systems to be enterprises. And we talk about enterprise architecture. But there's a problem with the term enterprise and there's a grand challenge with the idea of enterprise architecture. And the reason for that is that around the architecture profession, the industry hasn't stood still. We've scaled out even further and we've abstracted even further. What I mean by that is that if we look at uh, the definition of an enterprise today, the definition that we use in forums like this, I would suggest, is no longer relevant and applicable. Why? That's the big question. Well, when we as professionals refer to the idea of an enterprise, what we're essentially talking about is a closed box. We think about companies as if they're a container. And inside that container, we build other containers or components, and we link those components together into networks of capability, ultimately for the benefit of either the individuals or the organization itself, so the business units, the individuals, or the organization itself. That's what we do. That's how we earn our money. However, in, the day, in this age of highly connected systems, particularly with technologies like the, um, the Internet and the World Wide Web, most organizations do not live with inside a closed or confined context. Today, most of the architectures that we build actually arc out beyond the barriers, the edges of what we used to consider the classical enterprise, often the domains that we probably find hard to define. Not only do we find that the tendrils of our IT systems are flowing beyond the barriers of cl the classical enterprise, but they're also doing it away in a way that is increasingly beyond the control of the individual architect or architecture teams. Today, in the world of technology, or the world, the, the world of technology in which we live, it's perfectly acceptable to talk in terms of almost organic evolution. Systems talk to systems, Sy those systems talk to other systems, and eventually we produce the global network of connectivity that actually we're all bathed in. How do we apply professional practice in that open context? What are the new challenges that we need to think about as architects? How do we apply rigor? How do we get to the point where we can apply or can, we can work to all the professional standards that we hold so dear? That was the challenge that um, we started to think about, first of all, inside IBM. Uh, and ultimately, we took that up to IBM's Academy of Technology, which is the uh, elite team of technical experts uh, at the very top of IBM. And um, with inside the Academy of Technology, we started the Ecosystems Architecture team. And surprise, surprise, that was an exciting adventure. So the first question we asked was, if we talk about this network of networks or evolving systems of subsystems with no boundaries, no closure. What are we talking about? And we spent two or three years actually vigorously debating the definition of what an ecosystem should be. From that, we eventually established a starting point, if you like, a ground zero, a set of base standards where we could at least start to discuss formally the type of challenges that we felt we were facing in the, dare we say, hyper-enterprise age. And here we have them, here you see them before us. Um, so this is the seven plus one keys of viable ecosystems. Uh, I'm not going to read the slide out, you can read it for yourself. 
but it contains elements that, some of which will be obvious, some of which are embedded in very classical ideas of architecture, some of which are not so classical, and some of which might seem rather daring. So ideas like number four, awareness, an ecosystem must support instrumentation and observation at both partic participating element and group levels. This includes implicit awareness of its environment, given that this can be considered as both a unit and group participant in an ecosystem. So how, how do we apply the idea of context at varying levels of scale and abstraction? How do we make that um, a recursive or almost a fractal type structure? And how do we apply it across multiple domains, multiple dimensions for different reasons at different times in different colors in different ways. And the particular slide that you're looking at here, um, it, it did take us about 18 months to put together. Where did we travel next? So relatively recently, we tried to pull the uh, seven plus one principles into um, a very loose framework to uh, direct future progress. Uh, the name doesn't, isn't precious. Um, we, uh, we decided on the acronym VIPER because we thought it was familiar. It would be a appealing. This comes out of some work that um, my esteemed colleague, Paul Holman, has applied uh, with many clients on many uh, very successfully delivered projects. And Paul and I came together and took the work that he'd done in and around um, the esteemed community and with his clients inside IBM. And I tried to infuse the thinking here um, with the ideas that I'd primed and some work from a, a number of colleagues elsewhere inside IBM. And at the moment, we're now opening that up to the global community inside the open group, hopefully for um, wide and vigorous a challenge. So again, I'm not going to read the slide, but hopefully you'll see uh, some elements of uh, good practice here. So viability, integrity, probability, the fact that uh, components, agents, nodes in a network may or may not participate inside the network or network of networks, and that their participation may not be directly in the control of an architect. The point that we're trying, or the, where we're trying to head next with this working group is, we want to move on beyond definitions and um, uh, base understandings. What we're trying to do is push forward into uh, a phase where we can, we can openly ascribe to a set of recognizable tools that we can apply on top of standards like TOGAF. Where are the challenges with regards to actual practice? Well, if you look at, if you like, the de facto in modeling today, this slide essentially says that um, in order to fit inside, in fact, I'm, I'm going to digress slightly. Um, again, I was at a conference once, and there was a very erudite um, technical speaker who was on the stage, uh, and he posed a question to the audience. In fact, that's what I'll do today. So he asked the audience and he said, uh, could anybody here today give me the unit of measure, uh, a unit of measure for length? So does anybody in the audience want to venture a unit of measure for length? Yeah, millimeters, meters, inches, centimeters. Yeah, furlong, good, yeah, great, miles, whatever. Uh, unit of measure for capacitance. Is it, I thought it was Coulombs, could be wrong, Farads, maybe whatever. Um, so here's the, here's the killer question. What's the unit of measure for complexity? The answer is we don't have one. Um, anyway, this guy volunteered and he said, I think we do. Uh, he said, I think the, the unit of measure should be the headful. If you can't get a problem inside your head, then by definition it's complex, so we should measure complexity in headfuls. The reason that we use the schematics that we use today is that they're familiar with the human experience. What this slide is essentially trying to say is that uh, for years, from the very, very start of the architecture profession, uh, 
The weapons of the architect, the, the chosen weapons for architects have typically been the spear and the shield. So lines and boxes. We do everything with boxology. But every single one of these diagrams, you can distill it even further. Essentially what we're talking about is just nodes and connections. They're all graphs. But the problem with the type of schematics or the underlying principles of the architectural methods we use today is one of context. They're all good at describing specific context and applying specific types of closure. But what happens when you actually need to smash different types of diagram or different types of thinking together? And that happens in an ecosystems world when you can't describe accurately what you want to describe. How could you smash together a data model with a component model? How could you smash together um, a flow, any type of flow, with uh, a probabilistic representation of nodes, or I'm making this up as I'm going along. Uh, and the conclusion that we came to inside the group was essentially what we've got to do is we've got to arc out. We've, we've got to move away from two-dimensional thinking into n-dimensional thinking. We've got to be able to uh, co-represent different contexts within the same grander context. And when we started to think about that problem, about how do we deliberately get uh, an, an overlap, an intersection between different types of thought methods or approaches or methodologies, what does that mean? Um, and you would think that it actually speaks to a train crash. But we stood back a little bit further and we looked at the problem uh, from a distance. And what we actually found was that if you go out to other formal disciplines, then this problem had, has been and had been, so it has been solved many, many times before. So if you go out into fields like uh, biology or physics, especially, especially physics, what you'll find is, is that the physicists have had to handle problems like exactly like this, where you're dealing with different um, phenomena and you have to be able to combine said phenomena into a unified method of describing a situation. Let me give you an example uh, from history. I've just done some, uh, so I've just finished writing a book on uh, actually the history of information. But as part of that, I had to do some pretty deep research into the work of Alan Turing during World War II. And I was privileged to work with the historians at Bletchley Park. Let me tell you some lesser known facts about um, Alan's work during World War II. Most people think that he was predominantly focused on cracking the Enigma code. He was. Um, but later on in World War II, he also became interested or, or worked within a team uh, who were trying to crack a code called the Lorenz cipher. The Lorenz cipher, so the Enigma cipher was the code that was used by field commanders to send instructions to the troops uh, out in the field. The Lorenz cipher was the cipher that was used to send instructions from high, Hitler's high command outside to, uh, to the field commanders. It was a much more complex, heavyweight code. Um, and Turing worked alongside uh, a guy called Bill Tutt. Turing's contribution, it was actually Tutt that cracked the Lorenz cipher, not um, Turing. Turing's contribution, he worked in the field of um, Bayesian probability, Bayesian mathematics. Bill Tutt, and I think this is a crime because Bill's almost been written out of history simply because of the success and secrecy of his work. Bill Todd was one of the founding fathers of graph theory. In my mind, he was one of the first systems architects. He was the guy who understood how to link together ideas. And his predominant work on cracking the Lorenz cipher was actually linking symbols using graph theory. What Alan Turing did was he brought together the idea of probabilistic linking so that you could work across complex networks and reason when individual symbols were due to come together. Again, what's lesser known, the historians of Bletchley believe that the work that was done on the Lorenz code was later remapped to actually help uh, predict enemy positions prior to the D-Day landings in uh, World War II. And again, if you speak to the historians, that's the reason why the Allies knew uh, to a level of almost certainty where the major threat points were when they invaded the beaches. If you take forward that work, so if you look at probability, probabilistic linking of graphs, in, and dare I use, I'm gonna use a big word here. So in, inside architecture as traditionalists, we like to use words like hierarchy. 
Um, there are better words to describe the coming together of networks, and the ugly word that I like to use is an ontological approach towards architecture. And the difference between a hierarchy or a network, uh, the difference between a hierarchy and an ontology is that a hierarchy has a single, single entry point and has a root. An ontology has multiple entry points for multiple reasons at multiple times in multiple colors. And if you were to apply probability over the top of an ontological view of networks, you can, you can replace the, the term network with architecture at any level of um, abstraction, be that at systems or enterprise or ecosystem level, then you stand a reasonable chance of modeling anything. Um, and that's how you can cr successfully crash together multiple di different patterns uh, of understanding. Anyway, that's the point we got to. And rather interestingly, um, I'm doing some work inside IBM with colleagues who are interested in quantum computing. And the thing about quantum, the quantum world, and I'm, I'm very, very hopeful about where we're going to be going with quantum computing, is that in the quantum world, it is absolutely open up to that type of scenario where you're dealing with very high scale, very connected, very probabilistic networks of interaction. Um, so maybe in 10 or 15 years time, if I'm still around and there's an invite, uh, we might have a session on quantum architecture. Wouldn't that be a thing? Anyway, oh, sorry, um, I'm going to end there. That's essentially the journey we've been on. The point we're at now, as I said, uh, we've got the brace principles in place. We know what we're talking about. We know t some mathematical tools and techniques that we can apply. Um, so probabilistic uh, network theory, Bayesian techniques, as it were. Uh, there, are, uh, there are mathematical techniques like homology to actually look at gap, uh, gaps in architecture to figure out whether or not uh, we need to pay attention in areas that we're not. Uh, we're looking for able and noble individuals to help us on that quest. Uh, if you're interested, please speak to me later on today. If you're not interested, please speak to me later on today because I tend to get rather lonely. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to lunch. That was a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. job and I will remember uh, at some point in the future an erudite speaker talking about a head full of complexity. Fantastic job, thank you. So um, that concludes Toolkit Tuesday for um, this episode. Um, thank you to our speakers Chris Ford and Phil Tetlow and thank you all for joining us. Um, there will be, as I say, the whole session here in Edinburgh will be available on the YouTube, on the Open Group YouTube channel um, sometime towards the end of next week, I think. And um, we will, uh, you'll, so if you have questions, you've submitted questions, then uh, hope, uh, look out for how they are answered. Um, next time on Toolkit Tuesday will be November the 1st, and we'll be talking about the value of zero trust architecture. Uh, my colleague John Linford and one of our members, uh, Nikhil Kumar, will be talking about that on November 1st. So join us then for Toolkit Tuesday. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this time around.